Hi, Boan. Very good evening. Good day. Um, after a break, which of course was uh, due to all of you know the reasons, we have a fourth inaugural lecture from Professor Lalit Rajapaksa. It's my pleasure to invite Senior Professor Tishan Jayasinghe to introduce our speaker for the day. Thank you, Professor Ajit. It's a great pleasure that uh, I have to introduce Professor Ajit Rajapaksha, who is a very bright person. And uh, he, has, he had his uh, secondary education at Ananda College. He did advance level in 1989 after entering the Ananda College in 1982. Then he entered University of Monotu only in 1992 because there was a time that there were, there were troubles in, this, in Sri Lanka and they were affected. So after doing A-Level in 1989, they, he, he entered 1992, finished his uh, degree in 1996 with first class honours. And then uh, he was lucky to get Masters, 1997 to 1999, and then uh, he 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 got employment in Singapore, National Institute of Singapore, the Concrete Technology Laboratory. So although he was uh, doing work in hydraulics, he got a lot of experience in dealing with concrete as well. It's a material testing laboratory, and in uh, 2001 to 2002. Then he worked in a dredging company, a Dutch dredging company, operating in Singapore, uh, reclaiming additional land for Singapore. Then in 2002 to 2005, he read for his PhD at Saitama University, Japan. And uh, immediately after that, he continued his research as a postdoctoral fellow. And it was an Australian collaboration, and uh, he was lucky working in such projects because he was able to get many Q1, Q2 type publications. And then 2007-2009, uh, again uh, he worked in another project, which is which was at uh, Public Works Research Institute, UNESCO Water Centre, and. Uh, he had to work in both English and Japanese languages. So he is a researcher who worked in uh, Japanese language as well. And uh, again, he was able to get publications. So if he, he, is a very, he has a very special experience. From 1997 to uh, 2009, for about uh, 8 to 9 years, he was doing research. So he is a very good researcher. And uh, he has done research not, not, research not only in uh, Japan, but, but he has done research in uh, uh, Australia, Australia as well. Because it was a collaborative project. project. And, and then, then in 2010, uh, he decided to come back to Sri Lanka to, to serve our uh, motherland. And uh, that is the time that the war, 30 year long war was over. And uh, he joined as a senior lecturer in 2010. And uh, when, when he joined, I knew, I was the head of the department, and, and, and I knew he's a great person who can work, work very hard. So, a lot of accreditation work was assigned to him, and uh, Department of Civil Engineering was the first department in our faculty to adopt outcome-based education, and we had the first accreditation seat in 2010, and we were not ready at all. So we failed, but, but by February 2012, we showed that we and his team did. And then uh, in 2019, he became a full professor on a minute basis. And I have to say that, you know, Lalit is a great researcher. And especially he's very good with applied research. And uh, they have a master's program where 
there is a lot of data that are based, collected in Sri Lanka and sometimes they use satellite data as well. For example, these days we are designing an anticut across the Mahali River, uh, just, just above Malanampi, uh, just, just below the downstream Malanampi. The idea is to divert the water that is flowing to the sea through Mahali River after the Minpenikat to the eastern province, province. and the idea is to take water not, not on, on the ground, ground but above, above the ground using aquatics. And all these designs are done on, on the desktop computer, computer of Lalit because it is a satellite data. So, so that, that is a very good, good indication that, that you know not, not only do we research the we have to you know develop the applications as well. And, and to show the importance of this project, we are trying, trying to keep the cost around 200 million rupees. But the benefit is we are going to use the existing cascading systems of SOS. And because of that reason, we are, expect, we are planning to cultivate 70,000 acres of land in eastern province using the existing SOS system. Uh, or what, what we call Illagal, so, so there are so many cascading systems, systems. and uh, uh, using those cascading systems, systems we are going, going to uh, cultivate or provide adequate water, water for 7,000 acres and that, that project is, is on, on you know, at the design stage, stage. And, and we are planning to implement it, it, that project in the next two to three years. years. So, so it's, it's all done because Dr. Professor Lalit it's a versatile research and also he has so much data. So with so that, that, I wish, I wish to invite Professor Lalit for his inaugural lecture. Good evening to you all. Uh, uh, dear Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dean, Faculty of Engineering, Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies, Professor Mrs. Jaya Singh, Head Department of Civil Engineering, all other deans, heads, senior professors and professors, all distinguished invitees who have joined the event physically and via Zoom, dear colleagues and my dear students. My special thank to Professor Tishan Jaya Singh who introduced me. Actually, he is one of the leading academics, much respected, uh, who inspired us uh, to be what we are today. Thank you very much, sir. Today, uh, I feel very honored and privileged to address this distinguished gathering uh, as a part of the inaugural lecture series organized by the Faculty of Graduate Studies. I have selected a slightly odd topic. I remember when introducing the uh, inaugural lecture series, uh, one of our eminent professors, uh, Emeritus Professor Priyanda has mentioned that once the great scientist Isaac Newton selected the topic uh, of colors. I know I am nowhere close to any of those, but I have also selected a topic related to colors. Is the water blue, green or colorless? I am going to talk about my career journey and academic achievements in water research. Basically, the research and applications in surface water, groundwater and climate change arenas. I just mentioned about my title. Is the water blue, green or colorless? So I will be explaining my career journey and achievements in water research, referring to the research and applications uh, in the areas of surface water, groundwater, and climate change arenas. Uh, before moving there, uh, I need to uh, mention about several individuals to whom I am actually indebted for what I am today. 
I am a civil engineer who became a, a, an academic. And there is an interesting uh, story behind that. I grew up in a totally academic environment because both my parents were school teachers or principals. But that is not the important part of it. Since they were school teachers, they organized field visits to their students during the school holidays. And they sometimes joined field visits with their colleagues. So as a kid, we followed them. And uh, I have visited all Mahavali multipurpose project scheme sites while they were under construction. And I have even crawled uh, through some of the underground tunnels as access with uh, protective gear was not that restricted at that time. Somehow that experience as a kid inspired a liking in me towards civil engineering to learn how to design these big structures and how to construct and manage those big things and it became a dream in my life. Further, my father believed that the actual sense of civil engineering is embedded only in civil engineering. The actual sense of engineering is embedded only in civil engineering. Uh, actually, they never forced us, but I had felt about his preference. I was born in the rural village named Mabodala in Gampaha district, a place which has still not lost its serene village setup even now. And I started my primary education uh, also at the village school. I moved to Minavangoda Nalanda Central College when I was at grade two and moved to Ananda College from grade six onwards. By the time I did my O levels, I had already decided I wanted to be a civil engineer. So then I selected mathematics stream and that is how I ended up at Moratua. So I greatly acknowledge all my teachers and lecturers who taught us and inspired us to become uh, part of the University of Moratua and what we are today. Uh, last but not the least, I should appreciate my family, my wife Ganga and my loving daughter Vidara and my brothers and sisters for all the support and freedom given to me to attend all my research, administrative and project duties and all other work undisturbed. And I use this opportunity to, to express my special thank to the Faculty of Graduate Studies uh, who has given me this opportunity to uh, present my research uh, achievements to you all. And I uh, express my sincere thanks to all the staff of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, Department of Civil Engineering too. With this, I will move on to my topic. Is the water blue, green, or colorless? But I'm not going to give you a definite answer at this moment. I will first talk about my career journey and the achievements in water research, focusing on applications and uh, other research experience. The presentation content I will skip for the time being. And uh, Professor Jaisinger introduced uh, me, my academic and professional career. So I think I can skip that, but I will briefly talk about that slightly later. Before joining University of Moratua as an academic, I had some uh, early academic career or research history. So as Professor Jaisinger happened to mention, Somehow my undergraduate research project was related to structural engineering. So that was to uh, study 
the buckling of slender files and the resistance from soil media. And then after my graduation, I moved to Japan for my master's thesis. That is where I started uh, learning about groundwater hydraulics. And then after completing my master's, I wanted to gain some field experience. That is how I ended up joining uh, National University of Singapore and after that also the industry. So uh, after gaining some industrial experience, I Together, since they are blended and they always give me opportunities to perform better in my present uh, career life. I have been talking about my experience in Singapore. So while working for this land reclamation project, I did a very valuable investment in my life. I learned VBA macro based program modules, how to do programming using Excel. So Excel has an embedded uh, visual basic application using which we can uh, automate most of the tasks that we can do using Excel, Word, and other Microsoft-based software. And this Visual Basic macro has been useful for me throughout my research and academic uh, career uh, life thereafter. And I still believe that uh, learning macro and programming was an investment which I did not realize at that moment. So this has been very useful for my uh, research work as well. So this uh, experience uh, was in 2002. Later I moved to Japan again in 2002 my, for my PhD study. So this PhD focused on a new area of research, eco-hydrology and 
Eco Hydraulics. So it is a joint research project study with Saitama University Japan and Canberra University and Newcastle University Australia. So uh, I visited Japan, uh, I visited Australia I think for about 20 times from Japan where we visited sampling sites uh, moving around the Newcastle area uh, over a period of week for uh, sample collection and also data collection and I had the opportunity to collaborate with world-renowned researchers in limnology, uh, lake ecology and river restoration related fields. So the study produced eight uh, master's degrees, five PhDs and four undergraduate projects uh, with over uh, eight index journal and 11 other peer-reviewed publications. So after completing my PhD, I had the opportunity to join uh, the University of uh, Saitama University again as a postdoctoral researcher for another two years. After that, I moved to the UNESCO Water Center in Japan. There, uh, I had a very good experience working for a Japanese leading institute, the Public Work Research Institute, which is uh, research and also an administrative body. So there I had a very valuable experience with exposure to uh, various international working groups, UN, UNESCO, Meccan Commission, and IHP and so on. So this exposure to truly international research and uh, teaching career and collaboration with leading water specialists was a life-changing experience for me. So with this uh, two years of experience at the UNESCO Water Center, um, I will explain my research interest and research experience. So I have subdivided my research interest or focus into five different areas. They are interconnected, of course. I will start with on to uh, the introduction to water research, where I am going to explain my research experience uh, after joining uh, University of Moratu as well as while I was in Japan. Uh, so my main focus area of research, uh, I started with eco-hydrology. As I mentioned, a relatively new research area at that time. And then uh, I am working on surface water hydrology as well as surface water resources development and management, climate change impacts, floods, droughts, and groundwater related studies, groundwater modeling, flood forecasting, and so on. So why water, water resources management is so important? Water is a fundamental human need, at least 20 to 50 liters per person of clean, safe water is needed uh, for drinking and other purposes. This is actually the minimum. The water supply guidelines are several folds of this value. And in addition to that, water is complex uh, because it is linked to almost everything in the world. But complexity should not be uh, hindering the understanding. Water is a precondition for human existence and for the sustainability of the planet. In addition to that, out of the 17 sustainable development goals set up in 2015 by the United Nations General Assembly, these SDGs are intended to be achieved by 2030. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 6, clean water and sanitation, and several others are 
linked to water. So what is the issue then? I will plot the famous uh, Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. He mentioned that nothing, nothing is softer or more flexible than water, yet nothing can resist it. So water management has been a challenge to all since the good old days. So that is why water research is very important uh, with the present context. So what are the global water issues? Is there a global water so shortage? According to the present assessment, there is no global water so shortage as such. But individual countries and regions need to urgently tackle the critical problems presented by water stress. Then how does water scarcity occur? It is because of the uh, distribution of water in different regions uh, with different quota. So only 3% of the world's water is fresh water and two thirds of that is uh, tucked away in frozen glaciers or otherwise uh, unavailable for our use. As a result, some 1.1 billion people worldwide lack access to water. And climate change and bioenergy demands are also uh, expected to amplify an already complex relationship between world development and water demand. So, because of this, it is very important for us to assess the present availability of water resources and plan for sustainable future use of water resources available. And the map here shows the predicted uh, freshwater stress in global level in 1995 against 2009. 25. And if we move further, water stress by country by 2040. Actually, the situation is getting even worse. Some of the areas in the Indian continent which were uh, expected to be water scarce by uh, 2030 are showing uh, signs of water stress already. So it is not only because of climate change, but also due to various other anthropogenic activities. So the climate change is uh, actually uh, worsening the situation when it comes to water resources management. So what are the water related issues in Sri Lanka then? So issues and where we stand. Based on the records of disasters of the recent decade, the most frequent natural disaster in Sri Lanka is flood, followed by strong wind, landslide, and cyclone, all related to water somehow. And what is the impact of floods and droughts on the economy as well as on the population? So in Sri Lanka, we know that there is a spatial and temporal variation of rainfall. We have dry zone and wet zone, and in addition to that, Jala and Maha seasons with distinct rainfall distribution patterns. And increased climate variability as influenced by climate change impact causes more frequent floods and extended droughts in all major basins uh, in the recent decades. So losses due to 2016 floods were estimated at US dollars 572 million and the losses in Kalani Basin alone was uh, amounted to 153 million US dollars. It is uh, equivalent of uh, 23 billion 
uh, Sri Lankan rupees. So we can see the extent of damage caused by a single flood event. So in addition to that, the temporal variation of rainfall. We can see in these maps the reservoir storage deficit in 2016 and 2017. So reservoirs are only 20 to 30 percent full but no rain. So the rank of uh, our country according to several water issues we have considered uh, water scarcity and flooding, water uh, quality. So uh, in comparison to India, maybe we are in a slightly better position, but when we compare our ranks with United Kingdom, Bhutan and Australia, we can see we are far behind. So there is an issue and we need to find solution. That is why water research is very important at this moment. So I will first explain my research involvements related to eco-hydrology and eco-hydraulics. As I mentioned before, eco-hydrology is a relatively new research field when I started my PhD studies. So it is a cross-disciplinary field that emerged in the early 2000s as a result of recognition of the need to better understand complex multifaceted uh, interactions occurring in terrestrial ecosystems and uh, their connection to the water cycle. So uh, eco-hydraulics is also a similar research field still growing and under these we know that hydrology studies uh, basically the abiotic or the uh, natural conditions of the catchment and related uh, factors uh, affecting uh, river basins and stream flows. But under eco-hydrology and eco-hydraulics, we can address biotic as well as abiotic components. So today, uh, with the complexity of uh, issues uh, we find in various basins, this eco-hydrology and eco-hydraulics are playing a major role in finding solutions to those prevailing issues. So uh, introducing eco-hydrology and eco-hydraulics, the main advantage is the combination of hydrological framework with ecological aspects, that is the target, and then the method. We can use ecological engineering to solve uh, basin-wide issues we are experiencing today. So if we look at this uh, picture, we can see we are addressing several scales. The rainwater is received by the canopy structure, which is a micro level scale, and then it can fall onto the ground and become a part of the hydrologic cycle. Part of the rainwater becomes overland flow and then infiltrates into ground layer to become groundwater. So all these uh, combinations and in addition to associated uh, lateral, lateral uh, as well as floodplain functions can be incorporated under eco-hydrology and eco-hydraulics related uh, studies. So we conducted several studies both in Japan and Australia. So in some of the studies we did direct sampling, but in some other cases, we had to depend on secondary data because normally uh, for hydrological studies, we have definite data monitoring procedures. But as eco-hydrology, eco-hydraulics was a relatively new field, most of the research institutes did not have uh, an adequate database. So we had to carry out 
our own sampling, visiting the sampling sites on a regular basis. So this particular study published in a Q2 journal, River Research and Applications, it focused on uh, the uh, sage species and uh, sedges are actually a large type of grass. They can uh, play a major role in floodplains and littoral aquatic habitats. They are affected by uh, flood waves or seasonal flood uh, behavior of different magnitudes in rivers and streams. River hydrology and flow patterns are studied in relation to disturbances to sedges by river spades. And what is most important is these sedge species and uh, their communities can also affect the morphology of the streams and rivers. So uh, these studies provided better insight into flood wave, sedge, sand bar interaction, paving ways for further modeling studies to use uh, nature-based uh, concepts for uh, river restoration, lake restoration related projects. Uh, there was another similar study uh, that is also published in River Research and Applications, uh, Q2 journal, and there we focused on uh, various other aspects associated with uh, floodplain management. So in this case, uh, we studied how these sedge species can retain fine sediments and uh, they can prevent washout of fines, the erosion control uh, due to seasonal flood waves uh, to of different magnitudes. And uh, the river hydrology and flow patterns were studied in relation to effects of fine sediment retention and influence of uh, annual shoot collapse during river flood waves. And uh, the findings were again used for uh, remodeling these river systems. And uh, another study in a similar basin, uh, we studied the wet dry cycles of emergent aquatic macrophytes and their growth and how the colonization is affected by flood waves as well as how they can uh, behave as uh, we call them as ecological engineers to change the river habitat. So the plant species can not only uh, be a part of the floodplain, they can influence the floodplain by uh, forming uh, communities. So these uh, characteristics of different sedge species can be effectively used in river restoration as well as lake restoration related projects. So uh, in addition to the eco-hydrology and uh, eco-hydraulics related projects in Japan, we conducted several studies in Australia. So uh, I will highlight some of the research findings. Uh, according to the uh, series of studies conducted in Australia. Uh, we uh, carried out uh, several studies in Lake Mayol as well as several selected wetlands in Canberra and in Albury. So uh, the basic findings were uh, useful in uh, preparing database for uh, furthering the research studies and in addition to that uh, we continued the same study so that we can develop uh, several ecological models uh, to uh, simulate floodplain and river functions. So uh, 
these three papers were published in uh, Q2 journals and uh, also in Q1 journals. Uh, the growth dynamics of uh, various sedge studies, sedge species, as well as the lake restoration related studies in uh, Lake Mayol. This Lake Mayol is unique uh, because it is located in an upstream part of a basin. So the inputs or the nutrient loading to the lake is very limited. The Australian authorities are very concerned about lake ecology, but during the dry season, there had been algal blooms. So they wanted us to study what is causing these unexpected algal blooms. The reason is, since the lake is located in an upstream part of the basin, the nutrient loading is very limited, but there is a very high content of nitrogen and phosphorus in lake water. So we did regular sampling and we noted that during the dry season there is a huge increase in the nitrogen phosphorus concentrations in the lake water. So during the lake sediment investigation we noted that there is a very thick layer of they call it gicha. It is actually a partially decomposed layer of uh, dead material and they contain huge amounts of nitrogen phosphorus. With the temperature change during the dry season, part of this nitrogen phosphorus is released to the lake water. So they cause a nutrient overloading to the lake ecosystem and ending up in uh, algal blooms. So uh, with the climate change, these kind of impacts can become even severe and uh, the water availability as well as water quality is a major concern when we talk about water resources management. So after completing my PhD study and also uh, the postdoctoral post research uh, tenure, I moved to the UNESCO Water Center in Japan. So there we studied surface water hydrology and surface water resources development and management related research topics. So the Public Works Research Institute where the UNESCO Water Center was hosted, they had initially developed a hydrological model called WEP, that is Water Energy uh, Process Model. But uh, they wanted to use this model for simulating river ecology and lake ecology. So that is where my input was needed. So here the issue was actually, now we are very much uh, discussing about chemical fertilizer usage as well as the excess fertilizer amounts. A similar phenomenon had occurred in Japan uh, during the industrial era. The water quality in most of the rivers and the lakes had degraded significantly. But later, once they realized the issue, they imposed stringent control measures. So they controlled all disposal to the reverse streams and they managed to prohibit all uh, point source loading to uh, natural water bodies. But you can see towards the end of uh, 1990s, the phosphorus and nitrogen concentrations in the lake did not go down as expected. So their initial understanding was when the point loads were adequately addressed, there should be a significant improvement in river and lake water quality, but that did not happen. 
So then they realized that there is an issue. So they wanted to study it in detail. So the task was given to the Public Works Research Institute. They are initially they developed a hydrological model, but our purpose was to uh, use this model for river and lake ecology management. So we need to introduce the nitrogen and phosphorus components on top of this hydrological model. So we had to clearly understand the nitrogen phosphorus pollution traits and why suppression is important. So normally fertilizers are added to various parts of the farmland. Sometimes they may be paddy lands or sometimes household areas where they have home crops. So all these areas accumulate the excess nutrients during the cultivation season and when rainfall occurs, part of that accumulated nutrients gets washed away and they end up in rivers, streams and lakes. So in order to study this complicated process, we needed a very detailed modeling exercise. So that is how the demand or the need for this uh, nitrogen phosphorus modeling was uh, recognized. And in this case, we combined the existing hydrological model with nitrogen phosphorus simulation modules so that we can simulate the uh, excess nutrient uh, loading and unloading processes as well as how do they affect the river ecology and lake ecology in the long term. So watershed nitrogen phosphorus export is largely controlled by coincidence of high nitrogen phosphorus source areas and the runoff generation because normally when the phosphorus or nitrogen is accumulated on the ground, we need the erosive source. Normally, the runoff water can bring huge loads of nitrogen and phosphorus to rivers and lakes during the rainy season. So when we manage nitrogen phosphorus and when we want to introduce uh, best management practices, we need to study both low flow characteristics and high flow characteristics of river water. The importance is during most of the period of the year, the river flows with mean uh, flow rates or low flow values. But during the rainy season, the discharge can increase suddenly and the overland flow process can dilute or dissolve huge amounts of accumulated nitrogen phosphorus on the ground and convey them to rivers and streams at the end, uh, ending up in the lake in the downstream. So we studied the high flow, low flow characteristics in the basin and we try to introduce best management practices for watershed management. So the objective of the study was to identify the nitrogen phosphorus pathways and then treatments and best management practices, how to develop them, how to implement them. And to develop the process-based modeling uh, tool, uh, we wanted to improve the existing hydrological model uh, combining nitrogen phosphorus dynamics into the hydrologic model. So we selected a sample study site that was uh, Yatta River Basin in Ibaraki Prefecture. So that is a basin with 166 uh, kilometer square area. And we carried out a regular sampling session, detailed uh, sampling for river water and also for lake water quality. And the basin 
history indicated that the downstream Ushiku Lake was uh, listed as the third most polluted lake in the uh, Japan in 1999. So subsequently, a huge degradation in groundwater quality was also observed in the basin. So that is one of the reasons why this particular basin was selected for uh, pilot studies. So this WEP model or the water energy transfer process model had been tested uh, at several locations earlier. So we were confident about the hydrologic modeling component, but the nitrogen dynamic part was new. So we use the data collected from the uh, pilot basin to calibrate and validate the model. In the water energy transfer process model, the hydrological processes were simulated in detail, evapotranspiration, infiltration and runoff, and the subsurface flows, and uh, channel routing and river flows were uh, addressed by using uh, kinematic wave method and also uh, additional biogeochemical modules were incorporated for nitrogen phosphorus dynamic simulation. So uh, the basin-wide data collection procedure continued for almost one and a half years and then we wanted to test our model using collected data set. So these are the basic governing equations. I will not try to elaborate them here. But what is interesting is uh, when we incorporate the uh, material balance part to the model, the hydrologic model component also indicated a huge improvement in simulation results. Normally a hydrologic model works based on water balance concept. That is good enough for event-based modeling, for modeling one single event or a short period of time. But when it comes to longer duration modeling, the water balance alone cannot maintain the required accuracy. But when we introduce the material balance and the energy balance on top of that, we can use the energy balance as well as mass balance, material balance concept to fine tune uh, water balance parameters. So there was an additional advantage of incorporating material balance components to this hydrologic model. So with this exercise, uh, we verified that the model is capable of simulating not only the hydrological processes, but uh, the nitrogen phosphorus dynamics as well. And uh, luckily in Japan, we have all the records of chemical fertilizer usage for a particular uh, region as well as for a particular season recorded at the government authorities. So we collected these data and we tested them uh, using our model. And what we noted was uh, we tried several modeling scenarios. If we reduce the nitrogen and phosphorus input by 25%, if we reduce nitrogen phosphorus input by 50%, what will be the impact on the river water quality? So the results were quite promising and we uh, found that the long-term deterioration of water quality in the downstream Lake Ushiku was uh, mainly due to the uh, non-point source pollution, not due to the point source pollution. Uh, actually, the point source pollution had been well addressed, but there was no particular method for assessing this non-point source pollution component. And the developed model could be applied for that task very successfully. And the results indicated 
that there is a definite imbalance in the fertilizer input and plant uptake. The resultant amount is accumulating on the ground. And towards the end of the period, the rainfall season coincides with the harvesting time, towards the end of the harvesting time. Then there is a huge accumulation of excess nutrients on the ground as well as in the paddy field areas. We use this excess nitrogen phosphorus as input data to the uh, improved uh, nitrogen phosphorus simulation model. So using a grid resolution of uh, about 100 meters square, we could easily identify what are the source areas of excess nutrients and what are the deposition or the, the most affected areas in the downstream due to this excess nutrient washout. So these are the results of the hydrologic model component and this is how the verification and the validation was done using observed data as well as simulated data, both for the temporal and uh, spatial uh, variation of uh, rainfall and uh, river water conditions. And the most important finding was we could easily identify the reasons behind the water quality deterioration in some of the major groundwater well locations in the downstream area. Because with time, the surface runoff uh, is very fast. That can remove a huge amount of nitrogen and phosphorus during the major rainfall events. But the infiltration causes a slow accumulation of excess nitrogen phosphorus in the underground layers. They cause deterioration in the groundwater layers in the long run. So uh, we can see the spatial distribution of uh, nitrogen phosphorus amounts and we plan for the management applications, implementation of best management practices focusing on the model findings. So after the end of my tenure at UNESCO Water Center in Japan, I decided to come back to Sri Lanka. I am thankful to some of my colleagues who helped me in making those important decisions. Because when I was in Singapore, I didn't want to leave that very enjoyable, lucrative job. I liked field experience as a civil engineer, but some of my colleagues who were there forced me to go for higher studies. And same thing happened when I was in Japan also at the end of a three year term, before renewing the contract, I had some commitments, so I decided that is the time to come back to Sri Lanka. That is how I ended up at University of Moratua. And we used the same model in Sri Lanka. We selected Malwatuya Basin, and we applied the model with available limited data. The model results were quite interesting. Even with the limited data availability, we could identify that there is an excess nutrient loading in major parts of the basin. So basically the paddy areas as well as uh, multi-crop areas, they have a reasonable, uh, reasonably high excess nutrient amounts accumulated as a result of uh, fertilizer usage. And the final result is during the rainy season, they get washed out and they end up in streams, rivers, and the lakes. You can see some of the model results as well as model calibration validation details. Due to time restriction, I may not uh, go into details. Uh, here also, we simulated several scenarios. 
if we reduce the fertilizer usage by 25 percent, by 50 percent, what will be the increase in the stream and river water quality and also the reservoir water quality. There was a significant difference in the different scenarios and that indicates that the natural systems can well respond to the changes in our inputs to the system. So that is why uh, basin management is a very important tool uh, in water resources management. So in addition to the nitrogen phosphorus dynamics, we could uh, simulate the groundwater pattern uh, in the basin. But unfortunately, we have only limited data set when it comes to groundwater resources. So we plan to extend this study uh, when we are able to collect a reasonable uh, data set for groundwater measurements. And you can see the nitrogen phosphorus loading and what is the impact in the basin. The next topic I want to cover is climate change impacts. We know it is already apparent. It is not a pending issue. We can feel climate change impact and uh, the major basins in Sri Lanka are affected in various ways. They have floods during the wet season and due to the high climatic variability, we face extended droughts causing huge damage to uh, agriculture and other daily livelihood activities. So in this study, we use climate prediction data. Normally, climate prediction data is available for large regions. They are not available at basin scale. So we used available general circulation models and also the regional circulation models to downscale climate data and apply these data to Kalani River Basin and then to determine uh, the changes in the river water discharges, what will happen in 2050, what will happen in 2100. So this information will be uh, needed for basin water management planning as well as for uh, other development activities. And this research was also published in uh, Paddy uh, and Water uh, Environment, uh, that is an international index journal. And in addition to that, uh, one of our postgraduate students who completed his master's study here and returned to his country, Pakistan, he initiated a study in Hakra Basin. It is a huge basin compared to our own basins here. The canal network uh, amount to uh, colossal 30,000 kilometer length, and there are water distribution issues. So we use modeling exercises to identify the bottlenecks, as well as we manage to give recommendations to improve water distribution efficiency. And this research was published in uh, irrigation. Uh, sorry, I can't see the screen clearly. Uh, it's small fonts, so that is also published in an international journal. And when it comes to Sri Lankan water management history, we are very famous for managing cascade systems. So in this particular study, we wanted to identify how the sustainability of cascade systems are affected due to urbanization. So uh, we produced a paper based on a pilot study conducted in a dry zone basin. We use satellite data to identify basin-wide changes and also uh, we used uh, zonation and urbanization patterns to identify what impact has been caused to the uh, 
cascade system due to uh, urbanization in the basin. So this paper was published in uh, uh, conference proceeding uh, and uh, the paper was awarded the best paper uh, award during the presentation held in 2020. And in addition to that, we are extending our studies to built environment. So we carried out a review research focusing on uh, the impact of climate change as well as floods and droughts on built environment. And this paper was published in a Q1 journal, uh, which has an impact factor of 5.1. So the findings say that if we do not manage the ecosystem as well as the overall basin well, there can be serious impact to built environment. And we have recommended uh, how to uh, optimize the system using best management practices. So uh, I would briefly highlight my groundwater related research experience as well. So this study was conducted based on a data set collected in Maldives. We know that how do we feel to become a refugee? And it would be a bad experience and it would be an even worse experience if you happen to become a refugee, refugee due to the fault or due to the activities of some others. That is exactly what has happened to the Maldivians. The beautiful island nation of Maldives has been now categorized as a climate refugee group due to uh, ongoing climate change activities. Part of the islands will be underwater by 2100 and they have a serious issue with drinking water. So we uh, used the data set collected based on a project and then we try to simulate the impact to the drinking water with uh, increasing climate change impacts. So we used 2D, 3D groundwater modeling uh, with water balance concept as well as uh, pollute transport, solute transport modeling because when it comes to small islands, it is a combination of saline water and fresh water. So a fresh water body or a fresh water lens floats on top of a saline water mass and when uh, fresh water is over extracted, saline water intrusion is unavoidable. So this research enabled us to identify the critical limits for water extraction for small islands. With this, I will move on to some additional research achievements uh, and research promotional activities we have been uh, conducting at the University of Moratua. We have a postgraduate program, uh, international level or regional level postgraduate program where we host uh, scholarship students from South Asian region. And this program is unique because we have introduced problem-based learning or field-based uh, problems are used to teach students. They need to identify their issues and they need to find solutions for those identified uh, real life water and engineering problems. So far, we have accommodated 46 foreign students, 83 local students, and around 60 students have graduated, and over 24 publications have been made. And most interestingly, over 1,500 project-based learning projects have been completed over the last five to six years. Each individual module has a project-based learning exercise. So this is a very good opportunity for industry to collaborate with uh, research institutes. So they can uh, collaborate with our research institute to uh, address uh, their uh, issues uh, since uh, 
every year we receive about 20 to 25 students in our batch and we are always in search of uh, real life engineering or water related issues for uh, using them as PBL exercises. So uh, based on the findings of this PBL uh, research, we conducted a very successful uh, research conference in 2017. We were planning to have another uh, in the year of 2020, but uh, we are postponing it due to the present condition. So I think uh, we will be able to have it very soon. Um, in addition to the research, we are promoting various training programs there, and we have an outdoor research facility for irrigation, uh, urban drainage, soil moisture studies. And in addition, we participate in various webinars, workshops, uh, sharing our research experience with uh, agencies, individuals, and organizations. So some of the research were awarded with, uh, recognized with the award of certificates. And of course, the credit should go to the students uh, involved as well. And in addition to that, I have listed some of my project experience, but I will not go through them in detail. I will just highlight some of them and I will move on to the final part of the presentation. Uh, this is one example related to the port city development. There we had an issue with increasing groundwater uh, layers due to the plan reclamation. So we used a modeling exercise. We collected initial data sets and we carried out a comprehensive 2D, 3D modeling exercise to identify whether there can be a significant increase in the uh, groundwater levels due to the reclamation activity. We found that when an additional mass of soil is added, a reclamation is carried out, there can be an increase in the groundwater level. So that cannot be avoided. But what is important is how to plan for mitigatory measures and how to identify this exact amount of uh, race or the increase in the groundwater layer. So there had been some initial modeling exercises, but uh, they had produced very significant inundation due to increased groundwater heights. But during our modeling exercise, we found that uh, very high groundwater level increase can be predicted if we do not use our modeling properly. So in our case, we used 2D groundwater model and using the rainfall input as well as surface uh, water bodies, surface runoff flows, we identified what could be the impact to the groundwater table. And we found that if we set our initial conditions differently, there can be false predictions. So here what happens is the initial modeling has been conducted assuming that the land reclamation or the reclaimed land has an indefinite uh, width. So the actual condition is it is open to the ocean by other sites as well. So the groundwater does not uh, have to follow the longest path. It can spread over and get released to the ocean. So when we introduced these actual conditions, we noted that the impact can be minimized to a greater extent. So in addition, uh, we introduced a monitoring procedure to uh, ensure that there will be no significant impacts due to the land reclamation associated with Port City. And then the next example is for constructing a tunnel underground of the Gold Face Green. The 
government is planning to extend the existing marine drive across the goal phase drive to reach the newly reclaimed port city. But there is a condition, the goal phase green cannot be blocked due to a past uh, decision taken by the authorities. So the only option available is to go underground. But when you construct an underground canal across the goal phase greens, there will be a significant blockage to the groundwater flows. So the contractor wanted us to study how to minimize this impact. So again, we used an extension of the port city model to simulate the groundwater conditions here. And we noted that of course, there can be an influence because the free groundwater flows will be blocked by the tunnel as well as the apron walls constructed to uh, facilitate the construction. So uh, we carried out further modeling uh, exercises to identify what are the possible mitigatory measures. So at the end, we realize that, of course, there will be a significant increase in the groundwater level if we implement the proposed construction procedures as it is. But there can be mitigatory measures. We can provide through flow across the uh, apron walls, as well as we can keep part of the tunnel uh, open. So there will be a connected ground uh, unit which will allow uh, groundwater to release to the ocean. So by proposing this particular method, we managed to uh, recommend that the proposed solution can be implemented but with the suggested mitigatory measures. So uh, with this I think I will move on to the closing part. There are several other examples, but I think I am running short of time. But I think I will not be allowed to close the session because I raised an issue at the beginning. So that is about the color of uh, water, right? So I will directly go there skipping this final uh, project uh, example that is uh, about uh, transfer site in Kalania for Aruakkalu uh, waste management site. But I will skip it and then go to the closing site. So what is the color of water? That is the question I raised at the very beginning. Is it blue, green, or sometimes red, or is it really colorless? Actually, the answer is the water is not colorless. Even the pure water can have a very small tint of blue or hue due to the absorption of light rays uh, towards the red zone of the light radiation. But here what I am referring to is not the physical color of water. According to the water science nomenclature, we have a classification. We call the surface and groundwater that is stored in rivers, lakes, aquifers, and dams, and that can be extracted for our day-to-day -day use as blue water. Then the part that gets infiltrated into the soil layer that can be absorbed by plant roots and then they can be released to the environment through evapotranspiration. That part is called green water. And then we have the gray water, which is uh, household uh, wastewater, and also irrigation return flows are also sometimes called as gray water. So then the answer to the initial question I raised whether the water is green, blue, or colorless. Yes, physically it can be 
either of these, but I have been referring to the water science nomenclature. So the research I produced or I explained referring to surface water flows, ground water flows, they fall under blue water. Thank you very much. And I extend my sincere thanks to the Faculty of Graduate Studies for providing me with this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lalit Rajapaksa. Another inaugural lecture has come to a close, uh, but may I invite Dean Faculty of Engineering, Professor Nalin, to uh, token of appreciation to our speaker. Right, so it's come to an end and let's sign off for the today and uh, we'll meet again on the fifth lecture next month. Thank you.